When you talk about rivalries in sports, you can't do much better than Bjorn Borg and John McEnroe, and some of their greatest moments took place right here on the grass courts of Wimbledon. Whether it was Borg's epic five-set win in 1980 or when John got his revenge here the following year, Borg and McEnroe gave tennis fans so many unforgettable memories. So on this, the 30th anniversary of Wimbledon 1981, Borg McEnroe, two of tennis's most prominent writers, have authored books about their rivalry. Matt Cronin's book is entitled Epic and focuses on 1980, which many consider one of the greatest years in tennis history. And Steve Tigner, the senior writer from Tennis Magazine, whose book is called High Strung and is the untold story of tennis's fiercest rivalry. And we'd like to welcome both of you to Wimbledon Primetime. Great to be here. First of all, congratulations on the books. It's a great accomplishment. For people who um, were not into tennis at that time or younger generations who weren't around, from both of you, how would you describe that era in the game? No, I think that was the first, that was really the first professional era. The, the game had been amateur, um, sort of a club game, private game until then, and, and then that's when big money came into the sport for the first time. So it was something completely new. Americans, the U.S. audience was, was huge then. It was also a, a big recreational sport, which, which um, it hadn't been before. It was part of a big fitness craze and was it was it definitely gone public at that point, and there was just this whole new energy energy to the sport in, in the 70s and 80s. How significant was it that we had this cast of character characters, Matt, that came along, led by uh, Jimmy Connors, Bjorn Borg, John McEnroe, and it was almost like watching theater with these guys playing. It. Well, no, <clears throat> and you can add um, Arthur Ashe earlier than that, Ily Nastasi, who is the first widely recognized, temperamental, slightly hysterical big character who McEnroe, you know, later played at the U.S. Open in a riotous match. I mean, yeah, there were, those were people you could relate to. They showed their personalities. They were right in your kitchen. Um, they were on the back pages of the newspapers all the time. There were great contrasts. There's the Regal Borg. There's the temperamental, outspoken McEnroe. There's the gritty Connors. Um, there's Vetus Gerolitis on Broadway in Los Angeles, a whole bunch of different guys and women to a degree who people latched on to. So in researching the books, uh, you guys obviously come from extensive tennis backgrounds, but what surprised you? What did you learn in researching that you didn't know before? I think for Borg and McEnroe, the surprise to me was the relationship, McEnroe's relationship to Borg. He had been a ball boy for Borg as a, as a kid. He idolized Borg. He, you know, that was really one of his first um, tennis heroes. And a poster of him up in and his bedroom. And a poster bedroom. of him, and also and tried to and dress like him. You know, when he first came to Wimbledon, he dressed in the Borg um, pinstripes. And I think that that sort of, you know, Borg was the one guy that McEnroe really, who he played, really respected and thought he belonged in the same court with him. And and that that sort of relationship, and also the fact that Borg, I think McEnroe really liked the fact that Borg respected him. He didn't. He didn't look at him as this crazy young guy. He sort of looked at him as a peer, and Borg was one of the first and first guys to do that for McEnroe. And a lot of the older players hadn't done that. They'd, right. they'd sort of seen McEnroe as, as this crazy young kid. So, so I think McEn I, I was surprised by that the sort of closeness of McEn or, you know, McEnroe's relationship to Borg. And for me, Bill, I mean, I would say talking to people who played them and who were around them, whether it be their opponents or coaches or girlfriends or parents or friends, both the guys, and this includes Bork, who was not as outspoken, they elicited a lot of strong peel feelings from people. Everyone had a big time opinion and analysis of who John McEnroe was, who he would become, the same thing with Borg. How Borg looked at a certain person, how he played against them, whether or not he greeted him in the locker room, you know, whether McEnroe was nice to a certain guy when he was younger, whether he patted him back when he was older, whether Johnny Mac cheated him, you know, whether Borg dissed him, all of that. It didn't matter who I talked to, picked up the phone, everyone had something to say, and that is unusual in the sport. This is kind of where the brat personality was born because I had heard that there was a, a conversation with Phil Dent about the way you handle things as a, you don't give calls away in other words if you felt like you got the benefit of a bad call then you would give one away and he said we don't do that here and so John kind of took that to its nth degree and became the super brand right? yeah that's a great story that had happened at the French Open when Dent had first beaten McEnroe and McEnroe is basically giving calls away and Dent goes up to him the net and says look buddy that's not how we do it on the pro tour then he comes back to Wimbledon next time doesn't give calls away and 
beats him again. So yeah, and I'm sure Steve um, told the story, and I did too, about one of the times when Borg played McEnroe. McEnroe actually begins to lose his temper. Didn't think he'd ever do it against Borg because he's what, the one guy he respected so much that he didn't want to show that kind of emotion. Borg goes up to him at the net and says, look, John, it's not that serious right now. It is tennis. Just calm down. You're a great player. You're going to be a great player. And he was right. Yeah, I think McEnroe took that as, you know, when, the way he talks about it, that's the moment when he felt he was a real champion, too, that he could be something other than, you know, he could be you know, on Borg's level. Borg was taking him in as, here's a future, here's another guy who's on my level. How surprised were people after McEnroe won here, John won again in New York at the U.S. Open, and then Bjorn basically disappeared from the game? What, what kind of shock was that for people? That was shocking, but at the but when you look back at the way people reacted to it, the newspapers and the and writers and other people, it wasn't as shocking. And people th sort of thought, you know, the way Borg left, that he might not be coming back. I think, you know, John was obviously shocked about it, um, but there was a sense that that Bjorn was was burning out a little bit, and there, there was something not quite right there. That he was, he'd spent a lot of time just playing tennis, and that maybe he needed something else. And and you know, I think people were surprised, but. But when he didn't come back, maybe not quite as surprised as he might think for a guy who was 25 years old. And I think, Bill, I mean, I think some people thought he'd take a few months off. You know, maybe he'll pull a Kim Kleisters or a Justine Henno or Johnny Mack actually took almost a year off um, in 85, 86. People thought, all right, we know Borg is burned out. We know he needs to do some other things in his life. But I bet he comes back six months to a year. But I think the total disappearance shocked some people. There's no question about that because although he lost to McEnroe um, here in 1981 and at the U.S. Open was beaten pretty significantly, he wasn't completely out of the game. I mean, he was still a young guy. You know, he could still play. He was still going deep at all the Grand Slams. I think that most of the people thought, oh, how could he possibly waste, you know, three or four years when, you know, he ends up with 11 Slam titles. He stays at least 28 or 29. He could have Rogers 16 right now. He was still number two in the world at that point in the French Open champion. So it, the idea of you know, the current French Open champion retiring at the end of the U.S. Open. That is pretty, that is surprising. At Nadal's age. Matt, Steve, thank you. I wish we had more time. This was fabulous. Congratulations on thank the you. book. Thank you. Thanks. Well done. Back with more from Wimbledon on Tennis Channel right after this.